Good evening, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of Talking Landscape Photography. Uh, before I introduce them, we, we do have a very special guest uh, from the US. So this is obviously a, a premiere and recorded from before. Uh, we don't want to ask our US guests to be uh, talking to us at three in the morning to get quality conversation going. So it's fair enough. Um, Lukey and Ben, welcome on the show and um, quick check in on how you guys are doing before we, before we move to our guest. Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Going. Thanks for thanks for that intro, Paul. And yeah, really, I'm um, just so excited about having William on the show tonight and and um, seeing all of his incredible photography over such a long career. It's 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 a real gift, and and I'm I'm hoping everyone um, thoroughly enjoys it tonight. Mm. Yeah, really looking forward to the episode tonight. Um, yeah, Bill's a big inspiration, and um, yeah, just in his longevity in his career and how ahead of the curve he's been with um, how he captures uh, the the landscape in all its forms is, um, yeah, it should be inspiring to everyone around the world, no matter whether, whether you've seen Yosemite with your own eyes or not. So, um, yeah, no, very, very keen to delve into his career a bit further and see what he's got to say. So you, you jumped ahead of the curve, boys. I didn't even oh, say Sorry there. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have big William surprise. Um, live from our, our point of view, from um, the beautiful country in around Yosemite in California. What I feel particularly special about this opportunity for this show, it's rare to come across a living, breathing, working photographer that has his relevance has stood the tips of time and, and he's still producing work of world-class caliber all the way through and for 40, 50 years plus. And so William has, has had a lot of career based in and around, a, I guess, the sanctuary, as it were, of, of Yosemite National Park, which is one of the oldest and my special national parks in the world. I've spent a bit of time there myself, so I can I can vouch for that. William has produced a lot of books. He's been an educator. He's a gifted writer. Um, I'll ask you later how much how much that has passed down from from your dad, William. And you know he's travelled a lot of places in the world. He's worked with a lot of the great photographers in the world. And historically and unusually, he's one of the few photographers working today that has actually lived and worked with Ansel Adams himself um, in the early eighties, uh, which we'd love to have a conversation about. And I guess if you haven't seen William's work, his, his website is really prolific and you could probably even pull it up while we're watching, although we are going to be going through a lot of different imagery. We're going to be looking at beautiful work that he's produced. Um, I don't know how many books it is now, William. I lost count when I was looking through the thread, but currently he's in the process of of creating the Yosemite Sanctuary and Stone book. And he's also just released a, a beautiful new ebook on one of the great one of his many great passions which is supporting people curating their work and and bringing bodies of work together cohesively and thoughtfully and if you see william's work or you, or you spend time with it and we're quite aware that some of our audience down south hasn't i noticed on a lot of the interviews people will say we don't really need to introduce william because in america they don't but we're down under down here and we don't sort of have the same longevity of um, of knowledge of of kind of um, working photographers because we're a younger country, I guess. But I did um, suggest to William that, you know, we have our own legacy in terms of Villegas and, and Peter Dramostas in particular that he knows some about. So he's, he's not a, he's a humble man. So I'm not going to blow the trumpets too hard, uh, even though that's a bit of a US style. I, I'd like to let William's work um, speak for itself, but I will attest to the fact that personally there's a level of grace and elegance and sensitivity and I would actually use the word spirituality that is woven through the entire career of William's work to me and to me that speaks to someone that has taken to the time internally and externally to to slow down and be deeply deeply present with landscapes in a way that sinks beyond the obvious into into deeper more mystical and, and mysterious realms and i think that comes out really beautifully in william's work through the subtlety of his color palettes and particularly the intimacy and the physicality of, of how intimate the scenes that he chooses to engage with a lot are you know william can dance between the grand and and, and the finite and, and i think in a lot of his early early years he was doing a lot of macro and was pulling back out to go to intimate, you know, whereas a lot of us are, have started grand and, and we're slowly, as we evolve as image makers and get more thoughtful, we're, we're moving into an intimate realm. And I, I have a feeling that in some ways, William's journey has been the other way around, but um, absolute pleasure, William. We're hoping to lean into some conversations that we're really going to have access to someone that has a level of breadth and longevity uh, of career. Uh, I don't know anyone alive today personally that, that has that level of breadth. And I think, 
as a sounding board for ourselves personally, as the three of us, as well as our viewers, it's a pretty unique opportunity that we've been pretty excited to take. So I'm hoping some of our questions are um, honour you well enough to 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 lean into some learnings for people down here in a way that um, that few people have access to. You know, somebody with your level of of experience and yeah, you've seen things and you and you've seen changes in this industry like few people have and. I also want to nod the cap to you in that it seems like you've maintained a relevance and a, and a connection with the future and the evolution of photography to this current day that few people have. Um, so welcome, William. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you having me and uh, I've been enjoying your show uh, uh, mostly lately. I haven't followed it uh, all the way through, but I've gone back and really enjoyed your conversations and uh, happy to be a, a part of it and contribute. It's something uh, something I learned from Ansel Adams. You mentioned him. Ansel was uh, an educator, amongst other things. So he was very much into sharing everything and anything he knew. So, you know, I knew Ansel when I was in my mid-20s, and that was a big influence on me. And so, you know, being able to, to share through writings and through my photography or through interviews, it's it's um, it's part of that legacy that I'm happy to continue. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. Just before the show started, um, Willie, we actually used the word legacy. At least Luke did about, um, and it might come up. I'll, I'll I'll I don't know if we go there now, but at the same time, it's um, it's something you know that we all consider. I think to some extent, you know, you you've been very present and involved with the legacy of Ansel, for instance, and. I don't know how much that's reflected on, you know, what kind of messages or, or influences you feel drawn to, to leave in the world, uh, from your, from your lifetime of image making. Well, I had an interesting experience, uh, obviously meeting Ansel, I knew him for four years, uh, the last years of his life and, um, got to hang out with him and visit him at his house and have dinner with him and, and, watch him teach. And so that was, that was a great, uh, um, start to my career. Was when I worked at his gallery in Yosemite, I, I didn't see him all the time. I didn't, I didn't work for him. I worked for his family, his son or son and daughter-in-law at the time, uh, operated the gallery and that's who I worked for. But, you know, he, he would come to Yosemite and teach his workshops and slowly the, the, um, Kind of getting to know him and and getting to spend time with him just developed uh, as being part of the family, uh, the family business. And you're still engaged with the gallery to this day, I understand, William. Yeah, uh, I had the fortune, obviously, of, of working there starting in 1980, and I was shooting 35 millimeter, and I was shooting everything on a tripod. Uh, pretending to be a large format photographer and using small apertures and slow shutter speeds and and uh, finally in 1982 I, I got a four by five camera and and uh, I had the chance in 1983 to to show Ansel uh, photographs and he approved uh, my prints to be for sale in his gallery and that would have been um, what I was 27 or something and and that was still a you know pinnacle of accomplishment and so they've been selling my work at the gallery since since 1983. i was gonna say just what, what an honor to yeah that when we turn 30 have have your work selected by ansel adams as yeah, to be sold in his gallery like this must have been a pretty amazing feeling at the time yeah yeah well it's definitely fueled uh fueled my my uh track through uh photography and gave me courage to keep going mm. well it, through... it speaks a lot of confidence too william you know it's a confident person that would be presenting to their work to to ansel in, the, in terms of getting it in the gallery itself at that age so uh hats off to that one well yeah the um audacity of youth i guess so <laughs> was, uh, but i had had a chance to show my work to other people and ansel's workshops brought in um and a, a range of photographers from uh john sexton who does 
zone system black and white like Ansel did, but very different style, to uh, to Jerry Yulsman who's doing, you know, composite work and and so one of the things I learned from Ansel was in his workshops especially was that photography wasn't just zone system black and white landscape. So he had a very broad view of photography and he was very integral as you, you may know some of the history of, of getting uh, photography on the right track as a fine art and being considered a, developing the department of photography at the Museum of Modern Art with, uh, mm -hmm. with Stiglitz. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. What, what do you, what do you feel like Ansel's in his last few years, what were his main kind of aims? Was, was he aware of the, was it a sudden death? I actually don't know. And, and, and in which case was he reflecting on, you know, the motivations of trying to make the most of the time he had and in terms of legit, legitimizing the, the genre as fine art or what, what, what do you feel like were his, underlying emotions in the years sort of motivations and the, the time you had with them well i think um i don't think it really changed much he was he was uh, an incredibly hard worker he worked seven days a week mm -hmm. a close friend of mine you may know of the name chris Rainier. chris Rainier worked for ansel the last few years and uh, chris lived in an apartment attached to the house and he had to, you know, be mixing chemicals for Ansel, you know, at any given moment. But uh, but Ansel was also uh, uh, very social and had people over. Five o'clock was cocktail hour, and he would have senators and he, you know, people could call him and come. Can I show you prints? And and he would do it. He'd pick up his own phone and and. Uh, but one of the things I learned from him too, and in, in terms of his environmental legacy is that he was he was an activist i wish i could say the same but he uh got up every morning and and wrote letters to whomever he thought he could mm. motivate which even got to the point where his his uh publicity about wanting to protect wilderness in particular um you know got him in a a meeting with ronald reagan and and uh kind of wondering you know what's this guy ranting about and and uh he actually got to to go tell reagan himself what he was ranting about mm. so move um sort of from anzel to yourself obviously will uh because yeah we're here to really hear about your life and work um i'm interested to obviously something in those formative years really you know resonated with you in yosemite um, which is what obviously um, the the book that is coming out is about. Um, what do you think it was that really struck that chord with you to, you know, kind of begin that process of dedicating a life to photographing one of the most beautiful national parks in the world? Uh, just listening to the lectures, I, I was as I was saying about the workshop uh, instructors that came that were world class photographers at the same level of Ansel. Um, and and learning what they were uh, motivated by and what they uh, uh, how they managed to you know break out from any kind of norm that, to be creative basically mm. and so I learned a lot from that and and that was the that was what was being taught is to not copy and and to you know plow your own row and I, I actually as a I used to be a redhead and so I was a pretty stubborn redhead and and I had people I had you guys know Joel Meyerowitz right so or Ernest Haas a couple of photographers American photographers that world class and they come to Yosemite and feel intimidated and they say well you know Ansel's done it so I'm I'm not really sure what I can do any different in Yosemite and mm -hmm. and I was kind of a little bit stunned by that and I greatly admired their work and still do, but I, uh, I wanted to um, prove that that thought wrong, you know, that something different can be done uh, in Yosemite and, and uh, all the people that I listened to, including Ansel were, were kind of directing students that way. Mm. Um, 
here are tools. You know, what are you going to do with it? How, you know, it's like the zone system was, you know, a formula. Mm -hmm. And so if you follow it to, you know, like how Ansel used it, it would be uh, a certain type of processing for black and white. But that was not Ansel's intent was to, for people to process like him. It was his intent to allow people to be, to, to manipulate the tones in a black and white you know, negative to print to be expressive, whether it's deep shadows or open shadows or, or whatever kind of uh, high contrast, low contrast kind of uh, intent someone had, but not as he would do it. Mm. So that was, that was, you know, very much meant to be a, a structure and I'm just using zone system as a, as a, the main thing that Ansel taught is it was meant as a creative tool, not as a, a rote formula to process the perfect, uh, technically perfect print. Well, yeah. did you feel, did you feel pressured somehow? Because this is a, this is a relevant conversation to most people that travel to somewhere. Like I went to Iceland for the first time in 20 years and I'm sitting there going, what can I do that hasn't been done already? Or, or, you know, and there's that conversation that goes on, you know, do I need to go somewhere new for the sake of it? Or do I challenge myself by seeing what's been done to try move to move beyond it? Or, and I guess, you know, being one of the more photographed places I would argue in the world, Yosemite and, and having, you know, working with one of the, the, the people that's created one of the most beautiful bodies of work around it, you, you must've found your own way to either motivate you in a different direction or, or be inspired by, or, or even to move beyond or go in a different direction. Do you, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Cause such a big part of your life is woven through photographing in this particular landscape. Well, I've been influenced by other photographers in, in some ways more than Ansel Adams and uh, Elliot Porter being one um, uh, photographers like say Brett Weston or Paul Caponegro or minor white that were doing uh, uh a little more uh, metaphorical type of imagery. imagery. Mm. And I felt challenged to, uh, to try to create color photographs that had, say, the, the resonance that I felt in a minor white photograph of, of a landscape, like a mud hills or something that come to mind. So um, I was just in a position to be encouraged to, to, to follow what I, what I was um, passionate about. And it's, it's what I continue to teach is that, you know, people want to go places like you say, Iceland or Yosemite and, and maybe, you know, you try to come up, come up with something different. I mean, for all the years I photographed in Yosemite, you know, it's, it's not like I crank out unique images of Yosemite. It's like, I go to Yosemite because I love being there and respond to it if something hits me, you know, and it's the longer you photograph a subject, whatever, wherever it is, you know, you get selective, you go, well, this is, this was better last year, or I think the light will be better, you know, later in the day or whatever kind of um, analysis you make for, for making a you know, your own statement, it's, it's based on uh, being in the moment, the passion of, of responding to the subject. And every time I go to Yosemite, I, you know, I see something that amazes me. So if you can't, if you can't operate from that sense of wonder, you're, you're going to get, you're going to get stuck in a place. But I never, I never, I never got there. I I feel like, I feel like that, that's something um, that really inspires me about you personally. William, is you've managed to keep that level of inspiration alive over more decades than just about any photographer working currently still in America. And what is it, and particularly do that in a, in a, in a similar place, you know, not necessarily need the variety of change or the diversity of, of different places to keep that freshness and that motivation alive. You know, it seems to be just beautifully alive in, in, in the place that you live. And to be fair, it is a magnificent place. <laughs> and I've spent time there too, but what do you feel like, I wouldn't say the secret to your, your longevity, but what is it, do you feel like, because you've had a lot of time to reflect, I, I imagine, and a lot of people have asked, 
how do you keep that spirit alive? What what is it that, that excites you to get out of the bed in the morning still after all this time? And have you maintained that freshness and that creative energy over such a long period of time? Well, I, I, I'm motivated by knowing that I get I get inspired pretty easily. Uh, I mean, I find things to inspire me. It's just, you know, I know I'm going to see something that excites me, whether it works out photographically or not. Um, you know, the first step is is that connection, and and um, I mean, I haven't just photographed in Yosemite, so you know, all the the travels I've been on kind of help you know dissipate that focus on one place and i i traveled quite a bit um more before my kids were born and then um you know i've been to mount everest and antarctica and you know exotic places so to speak and china and you know it's it's just i've had had fun traveling and my wife is from india so i've traveled a lot in india and um uh, you know, I got to the point where um, when my kids were born, I, I wanted to stay home more. And so that's how it worked out. And I, I uh, would go to the coast like Big Sur or something uh, because it's only a few hours away. But, you know, my life and raising my kids were, were here just outside of Yosemite. For those of you who don't know, I live uh, by map miles, 11 miles outside of Yosemite, but it's a, it's an hour and a half to Yosemite Valley from where I live. So I live in the Sierra Nevada foothills at elevation 2,000 feet. Um, Yosemite is very diverse. It goes from about 2,000 feet to 13,000 feet. Mm. So Yosemite, uh, Yosemite Valley is 4,000 feet. So you get lots of seasons and snow, uh, we had so much snow this last year, the, the mountain passes weren't open until uh, uh, mid-July. The pass, the roads that go through the park. Yeah, wow. So that's that's due to snow, I presume. Yeah, yeah. wow, that's a, that's a long winter. <laughs> yeah, but that's you know, not, where, not where I live, not where I live, but up at the up in the high country, you have, yeah. I can be at, if I drove to Tioga Pass, which is kind of the high high point in the road, yeah. it takes me about two and a half, three hours to drive there. Mm. And I've got from 2,000 feet to 13 or to 10,000 feet yeah, wow. where the pass is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's usually the last to open up the area up in Tuolumne Meadows. It's, um, yeah, I, I, it's funny. Like, I didn't know so much about America. I got a one way ticket there in 2007 and, to kind of embrace my heritage. My sister was getting married there and almost intuitively, I felt like the first thing I need to do is I need to go to Yosemite. And, and I went there and it was, it was quite an interesting experience on a number of levels. And, and I'll, I'll tell a story and you can maybe reflect back on, on my experience in, in your own way to teach us more about a few things relative to the park. The first thing that happened to me is, is I got woken up at one in the morning by a, a, a ranger saying I had to move my tent because there was a wild bear coming down that was really hungry. <laughs> and I was like, it was my first experience of, of the larger wildlife you get in the States. And, and I had some more intimate experiences that I, I won't speak to later on also higher up in the park. And that was pretty dramatic to, because I don't think people realize, you know, in Australia, they talk about being dangerous, but we don't have mountain lions and grizzly bears and, black bears that, that can really, really take you out. We've got these little, little creatures that can kind of bite you, but it's a different dynamism. And the other thing that was my first experience, William, which I didn't actually expect is I couldn't just go into the national park when I wanted to. I actually had to go on a waiting list and wait days and days and days to be even just allowed to go on a walk. And coming from Tasmania where that was a non-existent prospect, <laughs> Uh, New Zealand basically as well, it was quite striking to me to the first thought process and reflection around managing a national park and limiting numbers and being more thoughtful about what could maintain a wilderness experience in a place that's so highly visited and being more conscious of the impactfulness, both as a, a walker and a photographer in terms of, you know, how what is the appropriate way to manage such an incredible piece of wilderness and 
I don't think so many people down here will know so much about the history of Yosemite Williams. So you might want to educate us a little bit and maybe speak to a little bit about your own relationship with how seeing that change over the amount of time you've been there in terms of the regulation and restrictions and and also maybe the attention to management and the thought process has gone behind maintaining the place. And you would have seen a lot of that change. And and I know you have a, a conservation background as well. In fact, my understanding is you've even got a degree in environmental um, management and conservation. So that might be a nice way to sort of introduce this national park to to people. And, you know, a lot of energy is put into it because it, it's my understanding it is one of the longest standing national parks in the world. Well, it's a it's a, a large park that has a very uh, very unique, spectacular valley in the middle of it, and you know you're a few hours from Los Angeles and San Francisco, and the, the mandate for the National Park Service is is to preser preserve and and for recreation. It's not it's not a wilderness area. Um, uh, well, most of it is a wilderness area, but the the along the roads and in Yosemite Valley, it's developed. So it's uh, there's lots of uses to manage. Um, mm. You're you're kind of pressing my my uh, involvement in the in thinking about this, so that which is fine. Um, you know, you you have to uh, consider all the different people that are coming from all over the world to see the place and and uh, a lot try to give them the best experience possible without um, it being too crowded it, it it hasn't changed all that much except just recently it's gotten super crowded basically since covid it's gotten really crazy but um and i know it was upwards of 2 million visitors a year is is that gone even higher than that William? Or? no it's it's closer to 3 or 4 million oh my god oh. wow Wow. And they all go, and they all go to Yosemite Valley. But, um, you know, for example, with the with the heavy snow years like we had this year, uh, once the roads open, people spread out a bit. But when Yosemite Valley is open all year round, uh, the roads it doesn't snow that low very very often, so it mostly stays open, and, and people come in all time times of year. Um, I don't know how they do it. You know, it's it's there's all kinds of debates on how uh, how it can be better managed during COVID. Um, it got to the point where there was um, a permit system to come into the park. I'm not sure what your experience was. Was that for a wilderness permit? Well, just, that was a wilderness permit, like walking back country. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but recently, they were till just this year, they were. Uh, they had a quota, and it's something that's been talked about as long as I can remember, since then maybe 1980 when they first started talking about regulating uh, entrance, and, and nobody was really uh, politically brave enough to try to do that, and COVID kind of enforced it. And, um, you know, you had a certain number of people that had reservations at the lodges or had campground uh, campgrounds in Yosemite Valley that could come in because they had reservations. And then, you know, on a daily basis, you could try to to get the remaining spots. So if you got on your computer at, you know, 7 a.m. and and um, logged in, you might you might get in. Um, and that went away um, just because of, it wasn't very politically viable. People, you know, plan their vacations and show up and, and they expect to see the place. For God's sake, <laughs> and so there's 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 a lot of debate. I kind of long for the a little more restriction on the the number of people let in the park. Lately, they were just actually this summer they were closing the park uh, in certain sections. They would announce this parking lot is full, or the east side of the valley where all the lodging and restaurants and parking lots are, you know, are full that you can only go to the west side of the valley. And so they tried lots of, uh, lots of ways to con control the, the, uh, the amount of visitors and the traffic flow. It's, 
it's pretty chaotic. So. Well, then, I've got sort of two questions in and around that. Uh, I mean, you actually studied, my understanding is that you had a degree in environmental conservation, I think from Colorado. And um, how is that kind of translated into your life? Like it's quite a commitment to actually literally go and study it. And has it translated into a more active role? Has it made your relationship with photography being a little bit more directive in terms of how it can be used for conservation purposes in your career or how would you describe that aspect of your your life as it were i kind of just settled into the the um the hermit like wanting to to just make my art but the education in college you know i took courses in the politics of natural resources and i took courses one of my favorite ones was that dynamics of mountain ecosystems so i had you know, some some background in the biology, ecology, geology, etc. Um, just to, because I wanted this, I wanted those courses. I started out uh, majoring in political science, and that I got pretty cynical about that pretty quickly. Right around the time Nixon re resigned, this goes way back now. Oh yeah. Uh, um. So. Uh, so I, I looked at the college catalog and saw all these courses like I described and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take, I'll take that on. And so, so in terms of influencing me, um, you know, throughout my career, it's, it's informed my work in the sense of just an understanding of, of nature, appreciation of, of it, um, curiosity about it. And, and we were talking a minute ago about staying um passionate about one place for so long it's just really goes back to having a, a a lot of curiosity and a lot of uh um passion not just not studying a place like like why is that plant there why does this weather pattern cause this or, or anything analytical like that just mm. just appreciation that of the all the dynamic connections of how uh, the planet works. I assume um, you still have some little pockets of the park, Will, that uh, you prefer to visit so we can be quiet and some unique perspectives? Well, it's an interesting question, and, I, and, and, and the answer is yes and no. So to describe Yosemite Valley, it's only seven miles long, and it's you know roughly a mile wide. And the road, there's a road that goes in on one side of the river and back out the other side. So being only a, mi a mile wide, you have um, traffic, mm. you have turnouts where people go, and, and a lot of the turnouts are ones that all the photographers tend to go to. And you have 95% um, of those people going through the park, you know, don't leave the road. So if you park your car and walk five minutes, you can pretty easily be by yourself. <laughs> yeah, well. So describe so describe it as as I have private places. They're not really private. Uh, mm. People, you know, other people, photographers especially, you know, know little nooks and crannies. But it's it's not mm. like there's a secret place in ten miles from the road that I know about because it's I, I find things in Yosemite Valley just. You know, walking down by the river and you know yeah in the winter when there's ice and the cliffs are reflecting the ice and you know clouds are r rolling around the cliffs and all those wonderful things that happen yep uh, the yeah, seasons we'll come and go have you ever done any climbing in, in the park Bill? not a because uh, if, if people don't know it is one of the more famous climbing places in the world and El Capitan and places like that, are, are, yeah, it's it's a it's a global lodestone for for big wall climbing, uh, and that's part of a lot of those nooks and crannies are filled by uh, dirt bag climbers, as they call it. And this huge, long standing, decades and decades of culture of of um, of people climbing the valley and experiencing it that way. But um, just conscious, um, but we haven't seen any images yet, and it might be nice to to translate the conversation into a more visual realm of. Yes, yeah, yeah. in particular, it might be quite an appropriate time to bring that to life if, if you're up for I, that. I Absolutely. will be happy to. 
we're going to jump right into my Lightroom here. And, and uh, once we do, I will think of things to talk about, but you guys can uh, ask questions. And, <laughs> and um, here I am drinking uh, a Coors beer with Ansel Adams. <laughs> I don't know how many beers I had. It looks like I'd had several beers, but I mean, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny now. I haven't, I mean, I've had, I haven't had a beer in a year. So, you know, I don't, uh, it's kind of funny to see this, but just to, to let you know that um, I really did know Ansel. I got to show this picture. Mm -hmm. Like Paul is asking me, I, I show, I, I share it every, uh, every year on Ansel's birthday, which is February 20th. So I'm going to cruise through. Um, you guys have questions about Ansel. I'm I'm kind of jumping into the book here, um, and you guys yeah, want to have for you, William. I, I, let's let's go down your your journey. Um, this book that I'm just about to release is um, is my second Yosemite book. My first Yosemite book was published in 1994. Uh, called Yosemite, The Promise of Wildness. And it was, uh, it just recently went out of print. So it was in print for whatever that is, 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so all along when I've been doing books, they mostly have been uh, uh, other people's concepts. And um, I'm not going to go into all the different books, but um, I never had a self-published project before, and this is where um, I finally got up the nerve to to try to self-publish a book. Um, How did you find that experience in comparison? It's probably oh, still exciting on uh, that. <laughs> being, you know, wanting to control every inch of it is is uh, makes it great, and it's also stressful and and uh, but creatively very exciting. So yeah. I've, I've been working on it for, I mean, the, the creation of the book itself for about a year. And I, I worked mm -hmm. in Lightroom uh, quite a bit to put a catalog together. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to just move along and, and see what I can talk about here as we go. Um, nice. And then making the, making the book, you know, I've, I was working with um, 46 years worth of images. Mm. Uh, as you can see some of the dates here, 84, 85. Um, these don't look super sharp on my screen. Hopefully they look better on your end. That um, great. Um, so I had, I had a great time, you know, pairing up images and, and um, working on the sequencing was quite a, quite a task. Mm. Um, a lot of the early images are, well, the very earliest images were 35 millimeter. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the four by five kicked in, uh, 1982. So, so mostly for about 20 years, I, I photographed with a four by five view camera. And so these are from uh, four by five. So roughly maybe a third of the book are four by five. These are both four by five as well. That's transparency, Bill. Yeah. Chromes. Yep. Saber Chrome. Um, uh, I did Cibachrome for a while. Yes. Um, so the, the film was usually Ektachrome or Fujichrome film. And, uh, in the early days, uh, I used Cibachrome, um, maybe until for about 10 years, I did, did Cibachromes. And, and when I left the gallery in 1984, I no long, longer had a dark room. So I had I had labs doing work for me uh, during that time. More four by five work and oh, ethereal. You know, it's cool. Just... What's up? Could you? Is it appropriate to give us a sense of how you created the kind of linear flow through the book, or how you've chosen to compartmentalize this one in particular? Because such a process, forty-six years of work. It's a huge back catalog. Maybe start to try and, you know, create a, a finite flowing, you know, narrative through through just a few pages. Yeah, yeah let me jump out of this uh, full screen business here and give you an idea. Um, 
I don't have my cursor on, so hopefully you can see my pointer. Yep. Yeah. So to give you an introduction to my my approach to, which is pretty uh, pretty crazy. I have lots of collections in Lightroom. Yes. You can see Big Sur. There's Yosemite Sanctuary. That's the one we're going to look at. I did a book called Light on the Landscape. That's that's there, and it goes through. And you get further. There's all kinds of tangents. Uh, Southwest um, uh, impressions of light are in here, et cetera. Wow, really, you'd really want to be backing up that catalog, wouldn't you? <laughs> I, I A lot of that. organization. I definitely do that. Um, <laughs> so, in terms of the book we're talking about, uh, this is where it all began. Mm. You know, I created a collection set and just started diving into it. It mm. got, it's pretty chaotic here. Uh, because I kept adding different things, but just to give you a, a rough idea, I was, in terms of paring down images from such a long period of time, I would say, you know, there's gonna be a lot of waterfall photographs in my book, but mm. what, you know, what do I want to include in the book? Mm. You know, so I put, as you can see, 23 images of waterfalls. Some made it, uh, most of them didn't. Um, and so I started with, you know, a, a, a broader uh, uh, gamut of images to, to choose from. You know, I ended up choosing this one. I really like these, but I, 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 you know, different, different calculations in mind. I've seen photographs of this or that, you know, that cat, you talked earlier about you know, having a, lots of images in my head. That's, that's part of the calculus and moving in, in selecting images for a book. Um, what what might be too similar so is this is this image too similar to that this one made the book uh, just out of seeing them next to each other you know i have a whole bunch of picture, pictures of bridal veil actually none of these made it um and then you know i said well uh well, what else did i go into Th there's a certain um um group of images that were taken just outside of yosemite uh, Mono Lake, the Eastern Sierra Nevada, where there's Aspen, like you're seeing here. Um, uh, I wanted to include those areas because they meant so much to me and it's my book. So what the hell, um, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I lived in the Canyon where this was taken, um, you know, where I took this, this made it in the book. It gets full of wildflowers in March. You know, but this didn't make the book. Yeah. You know, why, why is this one is more um, enigmatic and, and kind of that that survival feeling of this flower growing out of this crack that that this doesn't convey. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so a, it has a deeper, more mysterious narrative to it, I think, uh, the other uh, one. You know, hundreds of little bits of analysis uh, like that. Um, that one in the top left is gorgeous. I remember seeing that in one of the... Um, somewhere else that you posted or um in a book collection and it's just yeah it's just so beautiful and painterly um like it just really catches my eye and it's so well balanced um the colors Four are tones. beautiful yeah. and the textures um, and, and it's basically an hdr type of image it's, mm. i'm mm. shooting into the sun yeah so it was processed to to give that a, a luminous quality that yeah it's not yeah, like silver you like that ranges. Um, I think yeah, doing using that harsh light but processing it in a soft way just gives it such a beautiful um, characteristic to it that mm. you've done a really great job with there. Um, yeah, actually, that's that's an interesting thing to quickly little dive into as a little side topic is how did you sort of find the transition from darkroom processing to digital processing? Well, my my darkroom processing career was quite short. Mm. Um, when I started printing maybe three years while I worked at, and while I worked at Ansel's gallery, I used his darkroom in Yosemite. Mm. So uh, after I left the gallery, it was that the darkroom time was over and I had, I had labs doing the work for, for a while, like I mentioned. So, um, you know, the bigger transition to deal with was, was going from, you know, digital 
from film capture to digital capture and mm. and I actually found found it pretty easy actually and it, it was mm. um it was nice to have more control and more latitude you know going yep. from five stops with film to 10 plus mm. with digital was was quite nice mm. and and be, being able to make an image like this uh because it's a digital file yeah um, absolutely and it could you know you could do that in with film if you uh if you were really good at masking hmm. <laughs> yeah it's not, no, really it's not trash masks and like, like masks. Jerry. Mm. uh yeah and christopher Bur burkett is famous for his uh his masking abilities with his prints uh, masking eight by 10 uh, chrome film. So just to, to get back to the, you know, the book, you know, it came to, you know, it's only 185 here and there's 133 in the book, but you know, it, it, it went through a lot of gyrations to get to that point. And then when I worked in um, um, the book modules where a lot of the, the sequencing and design happened, so um i'll just I'll show you just a little bit of yeah, awesome. a yeah. quick, quick look look at the yeah. book layout and so um all kinds of factors came into it i have two sections of black and white uh you know starting here uh paul net paul caponegro quote um i actually talked talked to paul caponegro on the phone for about 30 seconds he said, I wanted to use his quote and I needed his permission. So it's uh, John Paul Caponegro got me in touch with his dad. And, and uh, so I got permission anyway. So the sequencing went through many, many um, iterations, mm -hmm. put it simply. Um, Do you, you have we any questions about your scene here? Were you bouncing any of the sequencing off anyone else, William, or did you do this one sort of really internally? Uh, my wife was quite helpful in the end, but mostly I got it most of the way uh, without without her, uh, and but she really really came through in the end to to pick out some some combinations that I hadn't thought of. So we were very collaborative that way, and we've been married for thirty five years, so we can kind of say what we think to each other so or at least she does to me um, <laughs> congratulations um, is she um, a creative herself uh no no i mean she is but she doesn't she doesn't indulge in it really unfortunately mm. i try to encourage her but she's she's a good uh, art director oh yeah. yeah you know so you know i spent lots of time if you go into you know the page sequences i would be you know, what do I want to put next to what? And I don't want to show too much of the book, but, um, you know, I, I tried to find, you know, the the similarities in, you know, water ripples and, and worm-eaten mm. tree trunks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I was able to, you know, sometimes it was complementary colors, sometimes it was the same se seasons. Mm. Um, you know, a high country, uh, set here, um, two photographs of a uh, photograph I took in 84 and in 2003 of the same tree. Mm. Okay. And I thought the contrast of the two, it's different seasons and, and, uh, yeah. uh, much more moisture in the one on the right. This is amazing how it just blends summer. into the rock. It's like. I know there's bugs that or spiders or whatever that just blend in with the um the surface that they have adapted to live on. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, that's fascinating. So I went through all of that um um for a year. You know, I I had some moments where I was either teaching workshops or had a project, but I I was turning things down to spend more time on this book. Let me get back to where I was earlier. See, there you guys are talking landscape. <laughs> I'm running to be in your catalog there. Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty yeah, special, but... boys. <laughs> oh my God. So where were we? Uh, we were here. Um, 
again, if you know questions about specific photographs, feel free. I'm I'm not always going to think of something profound to say about this or that. Well, I think if, if I if I go back to the bigger picture of how you do this, do you do you work backwards from say physically the number of pages you want to do? Do you just go back and forth? Do you settle on exactly where you feel like the the exclamation mark or the cohesiveness of what you've created is, and then oh, that just happens to be this number of pages or because you've got to sort of have an, an idea at the beginning of the of the end to create the visual flow and get the balance of the different design points and the pause points of where you we give people a, a rest or a shift from the visual to the to the written, for instance, to to create a balance and flow. Like, do you already know like sort of the the breadth of what you wanted to put in, and you work backwards, or or, or was it a linear no. process forwards? No, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm very low tech and very uh, intuitive. So I, these things, um, I've been stealing TJ's phrase, ebb and, ebb and, ebb and flow. Ebb, ebb and flow, yeah. But um, I, I went through that process quite a bit. And the, and the book was a little shorter and then, you know, started dealing with, you know, how many signatures. And once I started working with uh, uh, Jerry Greer, who's, you know, kind of helped me put it all together. Um, we had to to add a few, drop a few. You know, I, I thought I had too many of this type of image, or too many dogwoods in bloom, or too many uh, Merced River photographs. It, it, you know, there were so many calculations, but it was not linear, and it definitely wasn't going uh, backwards. So it was. Uh, you know, I got to what something I was really happy with and started showing it to Jerry and uh, we had to deal with the, the physical parameters of signatures and all those things, which I don't really understand still, but, you know, and we ended up at, at, a, at a place where I could, it seemed like I could afford to, you know, not, it didn't cost, you know, each time we add another signature, it costs more, so. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I really wanted to be, at, uh, and I advocate quite a bit about tight editing, and I I wanted to be a tight editor and and not uh, indulge myself too much, but 46 years, it was it was hard to to keep you, it. You, you earned the right, I think. My, my, ori my original thought was 100, so it creeped up to 133. I yeah. think you're very much excused. <laughs> from yeah, that. Sorry. I, I struggled to get down to if I want to do a gallery release, like my most recently recent gallery release, I struggled. I think I got it up to maybe 36 and that was from one morning. So uh, <laughs> I don't know how you did, you know, 46 years. That's insane. Um, so that, and it's, it looks like a fantastic curation as well. Um, yeah. For anyone who needs a space in their bookshelf filled, absolutely. Um, yeah. Go and order one. And one of the, you know, the uh, where you, you've done a lot of collaborative work where you've had a lot of other people that have written and engage with your imagery in written form is do you, do you sort of have and here you've got john don muir of course which i, I think is um i mean the, he's so woven into the fabric of, of american kind of relationship with landscape do you want to talk a tiny bit just about john muir like you've got a few quotes from john um Actually, here's one I've, I've seen you use before. Climb the mountains and get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you and the storms, their energy, while cares will drop off like autumn leaves. Like, well, I get that. <laughs> like there's, a, there's, a, there's a poeticness, I think, that comes through your imagery and in such an unspoken and very clear way. And I, and I love the way you you've honored these, these great writers and other people and created that, that, that woven sort of written word as well. And you're a wonderful writer yourself. Um, but I guess, you know, it'd be interesting to on a project, you know, of life and things like this, who you decide to put in or of all the people and all the writings that you see in your life, how do you decide which ones to choose or, and was that a part of what you really enjoyed about this particular book is is choosing wow. the quotes and the people you wanted to engage with the work outside of your own images. Yeah, and and, and John Muir is an example of of um, someone I in, in some ways I didn't want to include him, not because he doesn't have anything to say. It's just there's you know every book on Yosemite is kind of 
has to have John Muir, and I, I wasn't sure about that. And then I read this, and just a quick line, uh, but no temple made with hands can compare with Yosemite. So, okay, yeah, that fits a uh, sanctuary theme. So, yeah, it's in. Yeah, yeah, ah, uh, yeah, gotcha, yeah. So, so uh, sanctuary is a word you've used before, and, and I, I've seen come up with a lot of your relationship with this place. Do you, do you want to just speak a little bit personally to what that word translates to the reality of your life and your relationship with, with Yosemite? Uh, yeah, it's just a, the sense of being in a, a protected place. And uh, th even this quote, you know, uh, you know, brings that out and, and some of Ansel's quotes bring that out where um, there are certain places that you feel comfortable, excuse me. <coughs> and so that, you know, it's a matter of where you know, I wanted to be and where I was comfortable and it was um, uh, not, um, you know, situation to feel forced to create something because I'm traveling there. It's a place that's nearby that I can go back to over and over again. And um, when I get tired of being in the office, I can go up there and sit by the river and, and uh, relish whatever's happening at the time. So it's it's a you know it's several meet levels of meeting. My own sanctuary is is where I live. There's beautiful parts of the Sierra Nevada near me that are not in the park. And a lot of people in the town I live in like to go where there aren't regulations and and they can they can go fish and hunt and and take their quads and into the out onto the you know, forestry roads or whatever, and, and and that's great for them. But, you know, Yosemite has a higher standard of protection and, and uh, you know, it's, it's just, you know, the concept of national parks is is that sense of, sense of protectedness. And that's my, this is my home park. So that's where I've, I have always felt more comfortable. But it really is a like a sense of home for you, um, like just getting that such intimate, deep, you know, second hand, like sorry, just knowing it like the back of your hand kind of knowledge, um, that can only come with spending such a long amount of time creating uh, such a body of work and investigating and exploring and interpreting it through the lens. Um, yeah, and I think the work that you produce that is still so unique and stands out so well. It's just one of the best like exemplaries out there for, you know, taking the time to get to have a long period of time to create truly unique work rather than the sort of Instagram trend of, you know, smashing out key locations. And then the next trip you go to a totally different place and go to a new location, you know, three different locations a day. So you can tick off the hotspots. Um, and at the same time, you know, kind of waste that time because you you don't have the I don't know opportunity to breathe and explore and delve deeper into that place and instead create work that's very similar to what others have produced. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you really intentionally um, did that or it was if it was just how it naturally evolved, but it's um, just really cool to see how well that has worked in terms of creating beautiful, unique work from such a, a commonly photographed place. Um, yeah, I know that's just something that really reson resonates with me about your work is just, um, yeah, that invest, that deep investigation into every little facet of the park that, um, very few have done better. Well, the, uh, the photographs here kind of bring up my, uh, my approach because the, the photograph on the right is at the tunnel view where everybody stands the photograph and I was... I was standing there with a bunch of other people mm. and you know, it, it's a uh, quality of light and clouds that I've never seen before in mm. all those decades. And so, you know, it, it, it resonated with me. Um, it's not something, you know, it's not quite like the common view from the tunnel, you know, largely because of the weather, mm. um, you know, but it has a shrouded look and kind of a, Totally uh, 
you know, pattern of, of clouds through the through the valley and it just seemed to to fit with, you know, the the polar opposite of the intimate landscape on the left, mm. where there's that same kind of wintry color tone in the ice and um, contrasting scale and, and the intimate and the grand and the same same uh, two pages. Yeah, they, but they, they both have a wonderful swirling flow about them, which which I can see intuitively why, you know, they've, they've settled with each other. I was and, about to say the same uh, thing, Paul. Yeah, yeah like the yeah, the swirl of that bit. ice, like, is really um, of a similar vein to the swirling clouds and shapes in the one on the right. So they they tie together so nicely. And, yeah, but it's um, it's really not an obvious pairing, you know. Like visually, it wouldn't be the kind of thing that people instantly, you know, uh, pull together. And I feel like um, it'll come out naturally in the rest of the conversation. But I, I feel like as the more I get to know your work and and a little bit more about yourself, William, the the philosophy and the intentionality and the approach that you have towards how and why you shoot. And Ben was talking about the, almost like the allowance of of such a long period of time to give yourself the breathing space and and room to relate to somewhere in such a subtle, subtle way. And yet it's clear to me that with, you know, influences of people like Minor White and and their kind of sense of, of of grace and subtlety and almost spirituality about about the relationship with landscape, it's there's an element of allowing it to come to you as opposed to trouncing out there trying to take what you want. And and I feel like your body of work and your style and approach is very much that. And there's a quote that um that miners use. And it was funny in that conversation we had last week, I, I used to quote that really influenced me, spirit stand still enough for the photographer it has chosen you know it's it's more like you're the vessel for what the landscape wants to gift you in the moment as opposed to being a hunter where you're out sort of trying to get what you want and one of the quotes i've seen you use is be still with yourself until the object of your attention affirms your presence so it, it's it's a very I would say it's not an obvious approach. It's a more considered and, and deeper and almost philosophical approach to how to relate to a place as an image maker where that there's an element of surrender and allowance and, and wonder of, of what's going to come to you rather than clear directed outcomes that, that you're, you know, making happen. And it's a philosophy that I really enjoy. And I'd love to maybe hear your thoughts live on the show. I know you've spoken to it many times with many people, but, I don't think that's necessarily a way that a lot of people use, especially younger people, you know, they're not, they're not so quiet inside or or they maybe haven't come settled on their own being enough to be quiet and settled with what's around them enough to just listen. And I feel like listening is something you do in a way that few people have. Well, I think it's something that I've, I've heard others talk about before I ever, you know, kind of came to that, uh, like reading a minor white quotes that, both you and I have used, um, like you say, it's just a matter of being uh, receptive to whatever's happening and not not taking an aggressive stance. And you know, I spend a lot of time, you know, tr trying to survive as a freelance landscape photographer, you know, dealing with commercial issues and and um, uh, trying to make photographs that might sell as a poster or something that might work in a calendar and. I've d I've done commercial work and I, I learned uh, from Ansel that that's okay. Uh, whenever Ansel started a lecture, that's the first thing he said. And he had a kind of a high pitched voice. He'd say, "I I've been a commercial photographer for the past sixty years," and you know he he his lesson that he was teaching was that you know I I learned my craft, I honed my craft, I. I practice composition and dealing with lighting, um, you know, through commercial processes. Uh, and so in spite of the fact that I'm, I'm want to approach things in this, this receptive way, uh, I've been able to, to segment the, those approaches. And so the work that this, that we're seeing here are images that are, you know, with no thought about commercial commercial use, and so um, you know, I've had to balance the the you know uh, 
40 years of uh, unsteady paycheck. Um, you know, but oh, I've managed to, to juggle that with um, giving myself enough time to to see things, you know, in, in uh, subtler ways and compose um, images that are not so unique. And the, and the editor's eye is really a big part of that. I mean, if you looked at a broader selection of my work that maybe you don't see it, you know, you would see a lot of pretty stock photographs. I mean, that was a big part of my business was stock photography, you know, making photographs that would sell. And I, I did try very hard not to, you know, get taken away by that. And so I, I feel like I've, I struck that balance pretty well. Uh, but back to your, your subject, you know, the, that receptiveness is just something that, that, um, I heard being taught, um, there's a photographer, you, you guys probably know the, um, um, the book by Ted Orland, the, uh, uh, art of what is the art of fear i'm trying to remember the name of the book um anyway the there's two photographers i know were teaching uh in yosemite and they you know had students and we took them out into the meadow and they were the instructors and they had uh note notepads and they sent everybody off into little sections of the meadow and and gave them about 15 20 minutes to kind of respond to where they were and and then they were asked to, you know, write down adjectives about, you know, what they were responding to. And then, then the assignment was to go photograph what, um, what those words were about. Mm. That's and a I, fantastic I, exercise. That's, uh, mm. that's really cool. Yeah. Bill, um, I'm going to greedily ask you to, to show us some more images while we're speaking to this, because yeah. I, I don't want to yeah. get into the show and go, all those things we wanted to see and I feel like they'll come through because particularly this next set of three or four speaks a lot about the subtlety and, and the grace and, and also the spirituality of, of that deeper relationship of way of seeing that, that uh, there's just such a brilliant thread through your work. I can't say it better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the images do it way better than than my dribble, that's for sure. Oh man, I've seen. Actually, that. I was the photograph on the left. I was standing there with um, Alex Noriega and TJ, Alex. and um, I think Alex was aiming up in this direction, and I, um, I said, "Yeah, I'm going to get my camera in that direction too." <laughs> I was going to say that that one really stands out to me, um, like the blue and the green and the shapes um, and just the perfect cho choice of shutter speed is, yeah, beautiful. Really, really like it. Thank you. There's so many ways of, of photographing because having spent a bit of time there myself, it's sort of, it's so not the obvious approach. Um, and that's something so beautiful to have, you know, 50 years of, of or longer of, of connecting with a place and, the voice, the voice that you, the voices that you've heard are, are so much more varied and subtle than someone that just breezes through. And I feel like that's such a big part of your gift to the rest of the world. William is, is, yeah. is that subtlety of voice and that gets a bit lost or, or washed past or few people slow down enough to hear it. Yeah. And that's what I hope this book will do is, is in, other other bodies of work but this one in particular you know that a place uh, like yosemite could you know yield such a variety of images and the the parameters of the valley with cliffs and you know the the uh, the river being sh in shade here and the forest across the river being sunlit and with the with the cliffs you get more of that than out in some flat terrain so it's, you've, uh, got a, you've got a valley of ref, of working reflectors in a place like exactly, that. Exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. Oh, different moves. Do, do you have a favorite season, Bill? Or is it, I'm obviously, I'm guessing you don't because they're so varied, but do, do you actually have one? Can you admit you have one? No, I, I really don't except for, for the 
a quiet of winter, I'd have to, if I had to pick one, I'd pick winter. Um, but I've, I've, you know, I've found all, all seasons to have potential. Um, but especially, I say sp spring is a close second to winter. What about the um the qualities of spring draw you to? Oh, gosh, spring. Uh, new life. Mm. You know, freshness. Mm. Born again, not in a religious sense. Yeah. But the, rene the renewal is a better yeah. choice for me. Yeah. Mm. yeah, for sure. And yeah, contrasted with winter, it's... um. It can become very welcome after a few months of, um, you know, the the separate beauty of winter. But I suppose once that sort of those new signs of life start coming through, I can imagine it's a real welcome change. Bill, I've got a question that's a slight segue, but it, you alluded to it before by your relationship with people like Alex and and TJ. So one of the things that I've found really interesting about when I when I look at who you connect with and who you now even work with currently is you have this phenomenal history beyond most working photographers and yet here you are working with some of the younger and more upcoming and, and progressive landscape photographers in the world at the same time. And that's actually not very common for people to do that, you know, particularly later in their careers. Like what, what is it that fascinates you about the younger generations? You know, how do you actually create those connections in the first place? And what does it give you in your life to, to have, you know, I guess the the beautiful side of youth, sort of waving, weaving through the side by side, and who you are in terms of that, what they give to you and you give to them, and and it seems like it's quite a, a living, breathing part of your life to to keep um, very young, to have these younger relationships in your life as well in terms of an image maker. Well, I think that's that's what I got from Ansel. Um, he was always willing to give, and and for me, in a kind of the the history of um, color landscape photography, in particular, the the um, oh the continuum going back to Elliot Porter, uh, the, some of the earlier color photographers, Philip Hyde, um, at least U.S. photographers anyway that were um, doing wonderful work and and inspired me. Um, you know, and that that's Ansel's legacy to, you know, want to pass that on, but, I, but it's, um, uh, it's very encouraging in, in my later years of life to know that, like you say, there's, there's up and coming photographers that hold similar values and, and, mm -hmm. and, um, um, you know, appreciate the wilderness, you know, and, and, uh, Eric Bennett's the, you know, the youngest one that I really connected with. Um, and to see, you know, somebody diving in that deep and, and making strong bodies of work, you know, it's just, it's just a matter of legacy. Like, you know, this, this uh, genre will continue. And thinking about looking at these photographs, uh, kind of off on a tangent, but uh, there was a photographer you guys probably wouldn't know of, uh, Don Worth, who was one of Ansel Adams' assistants in the, uh, maybe in the 50s. And um, he was uh, somebody I got to know a little bit, but he he was making high key images, uh, very unlike anything Ansel ever did, um, that I saw way back when I worked at the gallery in the 80s. And uh, looking at these photographs reminds me of that inspiration, um, that images of uh, Don Worth's that I saw many years ago are, are kind of coming to um, fruition and ideas for, for processing images and, and to convey the, the, the delicacies of a, of a high key image. You know, I've re rarely seen corn lilies, you know, with that that tonal expression. You know, it's normally they're leaning into the the darker sort of curvatures, and and there's a lightness and a breath flowing through that, which is quite unusual, I think. 
I think um, another really cool sort of thing that I I feel will that you've quite particularly influenced you you and um, others like Guy Tal over in the USA have really influenced the sort of the younger generations of photographers really swinging back to that intimate style Um, because obviously it was as we all know it took a very grand hyper edited sort of swing for a few years there especially in the early teens um maybe about a decade ago now um and then you know as as we all know last sort of five six years it's really swung back towards that more natural intimate um style of photography um headed up by a few sort of key players um and especially in the states too um and yeah i don't know this this might be a multi-parter question but how, how do you sort of feel about um that sort of renewed appreciation and inspiration of the smaller more natural bits of the landscape rather than you know um that trend a little while ago where it was all about the 14 millimeter hdr um deviating from nature style of editing sort of work Focal blending uh, i'll jump in quickly because you're probably going to repeat it anyway but there's a quote i also wrote down that i was totally along this line that you'd written the extreme exaggeration or falsification of nature endangers my core belief that truthfulness best conveys the magic of nature. Mm. So I guess, you know, when you start doing focal blending and things like that in particular, where you're literally exaggerating proportions and, you know, changing the the inherent values of, of letting nature have the loudest voice, you know, like, like Ben was speaking to. And, and it really does. Uh, well, there's two things that happen with that intimacy. I think Ben, it's, it's one, it's, you can argue that it's a little bit more, truthful in a way but it also to me intimate landscapes are more reflective of the photographer themselves than grander ones are in a lot of ways um because of the subtlety of the choices you're making and what you're isolating and and what you're leaning into yeah for sure but um yeah well well, what's been your sort of opinion of or you know thoughts as you've seen that happen within the sort of photography landscape i i have to say i didn't pay that much attention to it Okay. Yeah. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> I think that, that, you know, people that I gravitated to were were um, were not falling for that, I guess. And mm. and guy guy is an example. I'm I'm so thrilled that he contributed contributed the prime mm. uh, the main essay to this book. And and guy and I have never met, but we've been email buddies for mm. about f- I don't know fifteen years. Yeah. And. Um, he wrote me when he really hadn't launched into his career and and was just looking for ideas and he was talking about you know making prints and selling in galleries and 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 writing too and and um, I didn't know at that time you know how how uh, great a writer he would uh, was or would become mm. um, so. You know that to see that um to see where he's come and how how powerful his voice has been um and then you know the getting to know a whole group of photographers that you guys know of but um there's a group of of us sort of that are part of this out of chicago group that there's, there's Michael Fry, who doesn't live very far from from me, and Sarah Marino, and and her husband Ron, and and there's a there's a bunch of photographers doing um, that are a fair bit younger than I am that are that are really carving their own way, and they, and they all a lot of them tend to know each other and and have a real real strong community, like the Nature Photographers Network, um, yeah, group. And that's tough. Uh, so those are all encouraging things to me. I, I, I'm not sure I really answered your question, except um, I, I mostly ignored that trend. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, it's funny. I mean, I mean, you know, yeah, no, uh, it's generational. I mean, I like it. a lot of that was on Instagram, which is a very, not a very um, accessible uh, medium for different sort of generations, and and some people just don't work in that realm. And you know, I was pretty new to Instagram, and I avoided it for ages because I never got excited about looking at images on a tiny phone and and i never shot square and I, and I was just like what is this medium this is weird and when i went how far it's gone i think 
I guess that to cover cover under Ben's question again, like how how deliberate and important is it for you to to keep you know nature's voice as the hero, I guess, as it were, you know, that in terms of um, you know, that quote about the danger of falsification and and that loss of sort of connection with the natural world in a very real way. Is that something that concerns you about generationally when you said you've avoided looking at it, but at the same time, you must be aware it's out there. And, and, um, and I don't know if in your educational processes or in your classes that you teach, do you, do you kind of like, like to lean into that, you know, innate philosophy around, around letting nature sort of lead the path as it were, as opposed to you, you know, trying to either falsify or exaggerate or, or augment things, you know, for your own purpose. I don't think I've been particularly evangelical about that um, in teaching. And I, I just started teaching group workshops just in the last couple of years. Um, you know, I, I just, I'm not sure what, how, how to answer that. I'm kind of stumped on that. Well, um, I mean, I think you're just leading by example would be answering it to be honest william your, your work just is woven the the outer fabric of all of that is woven through all your images so and in, and in another way without speaking a word you know like the most powerful thing you can do is is model the kind of qualities that you that you wish to leave behind as a legacy i i guess i, I learned that the hard way when i was a bit younger I think, I think that the um the book that i did a couple of years ago light on the landscape is a collection of my essays um that I wrote for outdoor photographer uh, over 20 some odd years um, is a, you know, I, I go on those, touch on some of those subjects in, in kind of an ancillary storytelling ways. And, and that's a good source for, for some of those ideas, how they come through in, in particular images, but also being involved with the, uh, natural landscape uh, group that Tim and Matt and the others uh, launched, uh, Alex Nail, and, and that's uh, something I'm, I'm, I'm behind, but I think people can tell that I'm not manipulating things much. And so the students I have are not asking me how to, to uh, shutter speed, do shutter speed blends or whatever, because I, I don't know how to do it. I was on a critique session with, um, with Eric once, we were both critiquing images and he was talking about making some um, Photoshop adjustment that, that um, kind, of, kind of a correction of, of a crop. And I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I've never no, I, done that. I, I think I, I remember an article where was it early on you said something about uh and it was in relation to to you know how much do you need to know about post-production and it was kind of <laughs> it was a question was well how much do you need to know like how know, long's a piece of string kind of question <laughs> you know like it's yeah for sure and well, yeah you're already producing work yeah. that is congruent and and clearly um clearly um encompassing your voice you know how much more do you need to know in terms of all these different techniques and bits and pieces I, i'm i'm one of those people that doesn't spend a lot of time on youtube learning about bits and pieces because i'm like well it's already looks pretty good with my simple approach um and why complicate it um it's only, it's only when I, I can't produce what i feel like i need to express that i start going oh wait a minute maybe i do need to have a listen and um like I'm doing a workshop with Ben soon, and and one of the things I'm looking forward to is is here's a way of uh, here's a skill set that I don't in post production and and a way of applying it, and I feel like I, I would love to listen and and learn, and um, I might surprise myself, and I feel again that not of the cap, William. That however you've drawn these younger relationships into your life, it's um, I can, I can only imagine it gives a bit of extra breath and energy into yours as well, uh, as well as a beautiful feeling of a natural a legacy of conversation that that you know through design or not is is influencing a whole other generation of photographers coming through america well the only way to, that i work is that that it, everything's two-way street so like teaching with alex i'm i'm learning a lot and and uh and watching someone a, a, a talented landscape photographer 
explore Yosemite in, in the depth he's, he hadn't previously and seeing what he would come up with and what, what struck his eye and, and, uh, and then talking about images, you know, when critiques, you know, things that he would, he would do technically speaking or compositionally, you know, it's, it's, it's something I've written about just the, the learning loop of, of teaching and learning and teaching and learning and photographing and, you know, making mistakes and, and the cycle is, is, um, self feeding. Mm. And if you have that, you have the, ign ign the, um, the realization that you have, have plenty more to learn in life, no matter your age, then, then it's all, uh, it's all uh, Joni Mitchell's song, Life is for Learning, right? Mm. I think, um, well, there's, there's, a sh there's a few things I want to jump in there. One, I feel like we're doing a disservice to our viewers if we don't see more of your images. No, uh, I'm, I'm second, secondly, just... I, I feel like um, that what you've just spoken of, because I asked you right at the beginning, how, how do you keep your longevity in, in your career? And I think you started with the word curiosity. And I think that's a big part of it, but you've also just alluded to the quality of humility and that your willingness to, to learn and evolve and grow through, through, even through the youth around you. And I'm, I'm slowly in my own mind, putting these pieces together of, of the threads of, of how you've kept such a consistent breadth and interest and engagement with, with photography in your life. Well, uh, maybe I'm just being selfish and want to learn, learn to be better myself. You know, I don't think, you know, that the learning stops. So. So if you keep absorbing, you keep learning and you hopefully keep getting better. Um, I don't want to stop on particular images, you know, without, you know, if you have any questions, I can keep going through images without. I, I feel like we, it would be nice to just go through. I also want to have a little bit of time for, for your Big Sur and ICM work that you prepared as well. So I think it'd be really nice to just flow through the images and let the conversation just flow around it um so we we all get a bit spoiled with uh a bit more breadth than visually in your work for those who want to browse uh, williams work in their own time his website is absolutely fantastic as well so i highly recommend you go there we'll put the link to that in the show notes um in the description below but yeah absolutely go and take a, a deeper dive into his work and get a book <laughs> because sometimes oh, yeah. seeing these in tactile tactile form is just um yeah, really special. Actually, that's a that's a question I did want to ask on the show. I, I alluded to it beforehand, William. Is as you've been involved in the world of print for a long, long time, and you know you've also been witnessing how that world of print is, you know, particularly the world of magazines. You know, relationship with outside is now is now closed, and you've probably seen the magazine world slowly disappear, and and you know the proliferation that most images in the world are now vis zeros and ones on the screens. You know where. Where do you see in that expense of your life of how significant print has been to where it's heading in the future? And and I guess you, you've got a breadth of time that few people have that you've been viscerally engaging with with print. And, you know, my concern part, and part of my life as well, is print going to be relevant in 30 or 40 years time? You know, where is its role? Where is it going? And And I'd be interested just to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I don't know how it'll be in, in the breadth of photography, but I think people like to hold uh, prints in their hand, like a book or a print, and they like to decorate their walls with, with images that please them. So I've had the part of my business has been, you know, corporate art, if you will, or, you know, art that goes up in, in um, healthcare facilities, for example, where, you know, the, the imagery is, you know, is that, that all of us that photograph nature are trying to, to, you know, represent it well and, and share what we feel about it. And if you're able to um, produce a poster, whether it's a fine art, perfect print or not. And, you know, I've, I've had, had the fortune of having a, a extensive line of posters, uh, pretty widely distributed. And, you know, I've gotten letters from, um, people that were 
you know, in hospital for, you know, weeks or months. And a poster of mine was up in their room. Beautiful. And they were um, deeply thankful for the, the, the beauty that came through to them. So forget about everything else that, you know, that happens, then, you know, it's all good. So what are we looking at here? Is this this part of your ICM series that you're alluding to yeah. that you want to share? Yeah, yeah. Um, just to jump back out, I'm just in the, this is my series called Impressions of Light. Mm. And most of this was done about 10, 15 years ago. So not very much of it is recent. So um, I had students that were doing this type of work and, and it got, intrigued me and um, and so I, I did a whole ebook on the subject and, and really enjoyed that. I don't do it too much anymore, but happy to share it with you guys. So let's dive in. Yeah, it seems like you've been experimenting with ICM for a very, very long time. I, like the breadth of time you've done it. Like so even some of your early work has, has, has a lot of that in there as well. It's sort of, yeah. It's not something that everybody sort of maintained their relationship over a longer period of time, I find. And it's, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the work of somebody who has. Oh, wow. Yeah, what I found was um, <clears throat> I had friends, other instructors that were doing, uh, dabbling in this type of photography. And then their students were uh, trying it out and, and ended up in some online courses I was teaching. And so I, I got inspired by students that were inspired by, you know, photographers dabbling in it, and I, I wanted to see what. Um, yeah, that's a nice. One. I wanted I wanted to see what kind of depth of work had been done, and and I discovered pretty quickly that nobody really had stuck with it. Yeah. And and I determined that I had much I had so much fun doing it that that I would not. Uh, dabble in it but i would dive in deep with it is that a is that a macro image yeah it's a, yeah. a, a poppy yeah california, california poppy well yeah. where do you feel like it really shines what are, what are the characteristics and qualities that you that you're trying to sort of express or, or dance around with, with this approach? Well, it's, it's my influences are, are from uh, impressionistic painters and, and um, Monet, et cetera. Um, mm. And I, I'd always enjoyed that type of painting and, and I dabbled a little bit in painting. I took art in, in high school elective classes and and enjoyed dabbling with that and it just was a, a fun way to to create a mm. a different way of speaking about nature it was a more painterly way uh, you were asking about printing these these prints are on you know i do on watercolor paper um which has a whole different feel than um the regular more photographic type paper i usually use so it kind of in a way, it it plays up the painterly part of it. So, speaking of papers, I I, I know that you use platine quite a bit in modern times. Do you, do you have any other particular type of papers? Are like you talking about watercolors for these, for instance, which would probably suit more than a more contrasty platine type? What are your What are some of your other favorites? Well, uh, these prints I print on uh, Hanamiyo photo rag. Oh, lovely! Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't. You know, there's there's not um, often there's not a lot of blacks in in these images. Mm. This is the famous uh, horsetail fall in Yosemite. Yeah, I was going to ask if this was a um, fire actually. Uh, it looked like that sort of light. Yeah, but yep. in, in a very subtle way though. You know, it's mm. not overt like at all. You have to you have to be you have to sit with it for a while, and you can go there or you can go somewhere else, which is why I like it sits on this in between point of interpretations of that type of um, effect, you know, whereas it, yeah, if you see it on a bigger, grander scale and the level of saturation people are usually using for that is pretty wild. Ah, oh, geez. Look at really, that. Um, oh. really shines in the 
and start um, simplifying the more chaotic sort of landscape um, and getting that painterly aspect. I find that it works really well with leaves um, and which it seems that you've really done a great job of capturing as well um, and water too. Um, so yeah, now beautiful work. And, and when I've worked with students, I've, I've, in regular photographs, I spend a lot of energy talking about spaces and, and graphic design of an image. Mm. And, and people tend to think about ICM as, as being um, uh, a little more casual than that. Mm. And I like the photograph of the winter trees. I'll zip back at that. I love this photograph. You mm. know, where, where yeah. I stood yeah. was, was very intentional and, and, you know, I, I couldn't find, you know, I have lots of pictures I took of, of this group of trees in the snow and, and, um, you know, I had to, had to find the right spacing between the trees. So and that, that plays up on, on some of these other images, mm. you know, even how the, the two trunks descending trunks on the edges are kind of framing in the, the ripples. Mm. And same here with the spacing. I'm not going to get on a get me started on com on composition. I'll you'll never shut me up. Are these tree tree trunks as well? These are uh, sequoia trees. Yeah. 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 Sequoias. Oh, wow. Beautifully subtle. Oh, that's the, I went through that group already. Okay. Um, one thing I want to do is, I'm not sure what, what time we're at, so I'm, I'm kind of ad-libbing here, but I did, did want to talk a little bit about this group, if you don't, if you don't. Oh, please do, don't please. Please. Absolutely, go for it. Yeah. One of my, um, my pet peeves, not a peeve, but a, a sometimes annoying is that the photographers that don't look at their world around them and only photograph um, when they travel. Hmm. So I've, I've taught portfolio development for, for many, many years. I taught an online course uh, for eight years and, and the lessons in my book are from that, that online course. And anyway, the, the, the point of this is that um, these are all taken at my house. And sometimes I, I, I planted these, these flowers uh, when I built this house. And then, you know, five years later, they looked like this and they've never looked like this again. Mm. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, I planted native uh, lupin and, and, they, and then the weeds took over and the gophers took over, et cetera. Um, but I, I find it very important for me in my life to uh, engage with beauty on a daily basis. And most of us as photographers, you know, are kind of always noticing things, the light or shapes of something, for example, but um, I've tried to bring it home. And, and this is a body of work I call homework or home Zen. Um, so I find things, this I actually picked up away from my house and brought it home and photographed it at sunset. Uh, this is right across the street from my house during a snowstorm, ICM. This was taken, the only one that I've done, taken inside my house. Oh, wow. Outside the, the window of the uh, office I'm speaking to you from yeah. on a foggy morning. I've, I've never seen it like this since actually, but. And then my wife grows orchids and I sometimes I get inspired to photograph them. Actually, I, I bought them to photograph them and then she got into to keeping them going and so a uh, little ICM orchid photograph again taken in my house this is just a couple of miles away from me most of these are right on my property but this one's just a little bit further away it's this this group of trees is right near where my kids went to elementary school so I would drop them off at school and then go photograph especially on a foggy day. And in the, in the light of finding uh, and making photographs 
in engaging with nature at home, I have a bucket of um, uh, Mexican pebbles, they're called, and they're, they're just colorful stones. And in the winter, I, I, I have a tub of, of these stones and I fill it up with water and, and they freeze sometimes at night. So this was taken on my back patio. Oh, wow. Yeah, you just you'd guess that that was um. Wanted to pick that just a stream or something somewhere. That's uh, that's fascinating. This is this is the same bucket. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. I, have, I have a retaining wall that is that the color that you see in the water. Yeah, it just looks like that sort of reflected canyon light almost. Mm. Uh, it's like uh, animals, yeah. so it's, it's a it's a created imagery. Yeah, wow. Fabulous. And then that another tub of water um i leave out during the winter and i walk out onto my patio and this this was taken on my back patio um the the bright reflected light is the sun uh hitting my the side of my house so these aren't out in wild nature but they are ways i choose to engage with the beauty that we can all find around us if we look for it. That's my sermon. <laughs> uh, this is a, a tree uh, that grows outside my front door. And I, I just collected the leaves off the lawn. I actually flattened them out. Um, so before they turn brittle, I, I flattened them and then uh, photographed them by window light. Beautiful. This is taken in my bedroom. These are like a curtain and a plum blossom tree that's outside the window is providing the the color. So the, actually the branches are not the tree, but the branches are in the the um, sheer the sheer curtain pattern. Oh wow! Jeez. But so wait, do you guys know Freeman Patterson? <clears throat> I you know who Freeman? He's a photo Canadian photographer that has written prolifically about the creative process and um, he teaches kind of how to engage with with photography around us and this is inspired from him oh, <coughs> this is like leaning against the side of my house a plum blossom mm. um, aiming toward the setting sun mm. yeah gorgeous and this is my fireplace, my my wood stove. This this is creosote oh, on my oh. on my fire. <coughs> I still I still can't equate that at all. Is, is it something molten or is it like a? Well, the, it's it's a glass door oh. to the wood burning stove. Ah, uh, okay. And, oh. and and at overnight, I turned the stove down and. Sometimes if the wood's too wet, it the creosote builds up builds up on the on the glass. Yeah, right. And then to light it up, I I throw crumpled up paper into the newspaper into the fireplace, and then it it lights up, and I have I have like ten seconds while it's still light, yeah, while the papers light. of that flash of light, and that's what you're seeing here. Yeah, wow, that's fascinating. It's pretty cosmic, huh? Yeah, so this was really... reminds this me of um bark that's been eaten by sort of lava, or larvae, mm -hmm. um it's from insects or whatever. Some sort of uh, Aboriginal art effect to it too. Mm -hmm. Very graphic. Mm. Then the same kind of seed head. I I photograph. I have a whole series of photographs uh, taken of uh, with white backgrounds with uh, objects I collect against a white uh, a light box left over from my slide film days. This is the tree out the front door of my house. Mm. Every, spring, I try, to, every uh, spring, I try to come up with something new. I'm shooting, basically shooting straight up. I love that really high key look that you've mm. gone for here. Like it's, it doesn't feel overexposed um like yeah. it feels very deliberate and just really highlights the textures in those trunks and 
um, even just the sort of glowing slight flaring of the direct light was really ethereal um, mm. rather than feeling Heavenly, like a mistake. Yes. Like it's, it, it feels just glowy. Um, so yeah, yeah, beautiful. Translucent. Yeah. Intentionally overexposed and mm. processed high key. Mm. <clears throat> then we had a, a peacock that would wander around our neighborhood and perched in a high, a high up in a pine tree, like at least 50 feet up. We would spend every night up there. And um, it was like living on a farm with roosters. He was going off early every morning for years and years, but he would wander around and come, come to my back door. And after many years of trying, I, I caught him. So this is standing in my backyard. The moment. And this is like, this is a manzanita or madrone type of plant. So this is also on my property. Just, this is an iPhone photograph actually. Oh, I was going to swear it's an oil painting is what I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I, I have some plants in the house and this is a house plant that sun came through and lit it up like this and, you know, run and get the camera. Hmm. And so collecting things is something I do like the seed heads or this is a polished abalone shell hmm. that I photographed about 20 years ago, uh, right on the desk where I'm sitting. Yeah, wow. Well. And then I built a little waterfall um, pond feature. This is it actually here. And um, right up, and I, I, I constructed it and chose rocks so it would have these great patterns of water coming over it. And, and um, if you look in the upper right it, where the, that where that water is coming from is where this is. Hmm. And so I'm standing up on top of the waterfall looking down at this and picked up one of the stones out of my um, my bucket of landscaping stones, plopped it in the photograph in the in the ripples. So I have my very own ripple, ripple machine right outside the, the back <laughs> very right outside the back door. Photographer's dream. <laughs> Fantastic. This is the, the color of that wall again, giving this this uh oh, yeah. tone. Oh wow. So this is the same set of ripples as this, but macro and slower shutter speed, etc. Okay. And this is another there's two levels to the waterfall, and this is another, the top level. It almost looks like metal to me. Mm -hmm. huh. So TJ Thorne has nothing on me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, ebb and flow, baby. Right. Oh, what a wonderful uh, set. What a wonderful set. I, I was trying to decide if I was going to commit to it, but I felt like um, I might challenge myself to take five photos within five feet of my front door after this because mm. uh, I actually do live in a place that there's a lot of scope. Um, but I think it's, it's more your imagination than anything. Like, mm. so Bill, we, we've sort of used up a fair bit of our allotted time, but at the same time, I know you prepared a bunch from the big Sur project and, and I, I'm oh, personally happy to give you some breathing room. I'm not sure if any of the boys need to shoot off, but I would really love to see that because I know you did the yeah, this, for we us. Can just go through it and not, not, talk about it too much and just so the big do you want to describe where the big sur is to people that are less familiar with it yeah big sur is basically in between los angeles and san francisco uh do pretty much due west from yosemite um and it's a very uh, dramatic area of of the coast with uh sea stacks like these and and um wonderful formations of rocks it's, it's surprisingly unpopulated and, and steep and, and quite difficult to access for somewhere that's because I, I did a lot of journeys down there myself because it was it was only like four or five places on this huge sort of five hour drive you can easily kind of access actually getting down to the coast because the yeah the, the road is a cliff top edge and it actually closes quite a lot with slips in fact the last time I was there we couldn't even get through most of it because yeah. uh, it's so it's steep closed. it's it's just, it's strangely just so different from everywhere else in California. Um, and the accessibility is quite of a part of it. It's, 
it has a very dramatic sort of mood. People don't realize a lot of Californian coastline is often covered in fog and has a dark and moody kind of feel. You don't think of that when you think of California, but a lot of the, particularly the Northern Californian coastline is just full of it. Yeah, mostly in the summer you get the fog and it's, uh, it, the highs can be 105 here and, and uh, 55 on the coast. Yeah, California, the cold California coast. What was that? Oh, who, who did that famous quote? Mark, Mark, Mark Twain. Mark Twain, yeah. The, what is it? The, the the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. Summer in San Francisco. And I, I I moved when I first moved there. I was on the Presidio, and I didn't see the sun for six weeks, and I froze yeah. my nuts off. And it was the it was the peak of summer in California, and I was like, "What the hell happened to California?" I was like <laughs> what? Yeah. Geez, that could almost be like an aerial shot of a of an ocean reflection or something. That one before, like goodness me. Oh yeah, that's from a. A cliff aiming down at the surf. Yeah. Oh, it literally is. Oh my god, but it could speed. Yeah, I could. Surf. That was yeah. sometimes yeah. like Mac. Like that one truly baffled me as to whether it was macro ah. or from like a a larger vantage point. Mm. Um, and it kind of looks like it could be like just like pointing down at the sand right at your feet. Oh my goodness! Um, it does. And yeah, I feel like a lot of the time the word abstract is thrown around when it's actually quite clear what the subject is or what the scale is. I was like truly baffled. I knew it, it was clearly water, but I had no idea what the scale was there. Well, um, I'm still I was convinced actually, it's a macro and not, yeah. not a grand descent. I I, yeah, I'm struggling to move past that Yeah, not being macro. <laughs> so um, that's really fascinating. Good. Yeah. Good. I mean, that's... that's um conveying a sense of wonder as part of you know making those sorts of ab abstract images mm. you guys know you guys know about that yeah and so uh yeah you know if you're too literal it's easy peasy to read what's going on and move on mm. or you know i've always wanted to make images that ask questions rather than answer them yeah yeah that was that was you, you've done that that was one of the what things i wrote down to to do you want to, as we go through these, do you want to just speak to that aspect of things a little bit? Like, what do you mean by that? And, and what do you think that asks of people or, you know, what's the intentionality behind that? Just not to worry about being literal and describing everything about where you are. It's like taking, you know, intimate landscapes or a rock abstract like this, where, you know, you, you don't necessarily know the scale, like the surf shot or, or this could be, um a couple of inches or it could be you know 10 feet wide you know you don't really know and it's it's, it's just a way of um, um engagement really want yeah, ben, uh, ben, ben's want pretty thought on this one. <laughs> yeah to, I, I love my rock details um this this reminds me of a shot that nick monk has actually um there's some some similar looking rocks on the tassie west coast um and yeah, just yeah, geology and rocks can just create so many different amazing patterns. And this is yeah, just one of yeah, just another great exemplar of um yeah, no, I love it. You, <laughs> Show me rock of... abstracts all day and I'll 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 very much enjoy them. Have you heard of a photographer in the UK called Joe Rainbow, William? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had him on years ago, actually, and you might want to look at that show because a lot of a lot of his body of work was was you know very deeply considered rock abstracts and and if, if you ever want to go down that path just scroll down the youtube channel and find it and yeah. incredibly thoughtful man and and we've also said many times one of our favorite guests actually david southern's another he's one of my favorite if very sandstone details has david southern come on the show yet no we no. might have to get him on because I think he's put out a book of it and I couldn't afford it at the time, but um, I'd love to get a copy of it at some point. But yeah, I think he had some stuff in NLPA doing really well in previous years too. Yeah, he did. Um, so yeah, sorry to deviate from Will's beautiful work here, but oh, no, that's nice, right. little, uh, <laughs> nice little rabbit hole to get into is the, the great niche of rock details and rock abstracts. Yeah, look at that. Love the high key trip in there. You can go on a trip with Ben and um, there's this beautiful landscape scene, just Grand Vista, and he's sitting there sh shooting at his feet <laughs> most of the time. It's, it's really fun to watch. <laughs> exactly. I had that experience once in uh, 
uh, Great Smokies National Park with a workshop group. Mm. I, I, one of the, the main views I had my workshop group photographing rock abstracts, mm. you know, basically in the middle of the parking lot, aiming completely in the wrong direction. Mm. Yeah, and, uh, and there is no people, wrong direction. <laughs> well, from the people that were staring at us. Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's the fog we were speaking of. Yeah, yeah beautiful. How that that deviant sort of tree is such a fantastic subject, like amongst the relatively straight mm-hmm. ones around it, and then just have this elbow of a branch just completely sticking out like that. Mm-hmm. What a yeah, fantastic composition. Yeah, the it's characterization that, of that tree is superb. It's right in the middle of town. And that, I mean, the, the ocean's actually on the other side of these trees, but I'm standing in the middle of a street with houses all around me. Mm. <laughs> were you in Carmel or where were you? Uh, Pacific Grove. Pacific Grove, yeah. Mm. Oh. This is that a that fog. That is some thick fog. That is super thick. This was taken many years ago. Um, I haven't quite seen the fog like this since, but uh, I keep going back for more. And and uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was back, and this was taken just a couple of weeks ago. Oh yeah, gorgeous. It's a bar tree. Yeah. Monterey pines. Mm. Luke loves some beach on. Uh, creek on beach action actually on beach loki um, we're, we're getting all our bounces covered we've we've had area on <laughs> creek on beach and and macro macro rock abstracts we're, we're all getting pretty excited have been itching in our feet here watching this it's of our aerials for paul's tickle and yeah, uh, that's right. no <laughs> well, yeah we, we got that beautiful golden one from way oh, that's up high. That, that's looks like nothing we've ever seen I, I would call that an aerial shot for sure hmm. can we just go back a little bit i wouldn't spend enough time with that one let's go back oh there we go oh that's that glossy texture of the rocks is fantastic. Like just, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've hardly ever seen that level of um, enamel sort of like feeling that it has, you know, it almost feels like there's a, somebody's painted resin over the top of the rocks. Mm. Yep. Got to catch it while it's, it's, it's only a few seconds. It, you got that. Wet. Mm. Yeah. Very wet. Yeah. It takes a few frames to get, Gets a few good ones. Mm. So surf's coming in and out. And yeah, it's not for the faint heart of that coastline in terms of putting planting yourself right on the ocean edge. It's just a pretty wild dynamic yeah. place. You've probably got a few close call stories, I imagine, William, over the years, but no, not really. I'm pretty I'm pretty tame. But yeah, I probably got you know, a couple of places. More it's more edge of cliffs than mm. surf. Yeah. I've done both. I've almost got cleaned up by the surf down there. Oh, oh it's quite, it's not, not so many images we've seen today have, have been that high contrast, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's almost like quite, it's quite a few photos in one, but they all have a deliberateness and, and a journey sort of through this, this S curve flow from yeah. beginning to end. And well, yet, <coughs> I could see a total abstract as a, as a square shot at the bottom of frame as, as much as I could see it sort of weaving through from, from the bottom to the top. I have to force myself to widen out. So I just, just tried to, to, um, yeah, wide angles don't get much of a workout in your kit, uh, from what I've seen. No, I mean, I have a 16 to 35 that I probably use just a couple times a year. Yeah, there you go. Don't tell Luke. He's, he's 12, 24 all the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been going in a little bit closer these days, but, um, yeah, for a scene like this, it'd be hard to go past a bit of a wider. What a comp for sure. I love the how the, the the balance in that shot, um, without needing to center the sun in the distance is really nice. Mm. Oh, I feel I feel pretty spoiled now. I sort of we were getting halfway through thinking we were doing a lot of talking, we're not looking at so many photos, and now I feel completely satisfied in that regard, uh, Bill. So thank you for um giving us giving us the breath and taking the time to present a, quite a wider body of work too, I think. Mm. Uh, although given the philosophies that we've spoken of, you can see the threads of the way you see and, and the qualities and characteristics that you're looking for thread really beautifully through a wider scope of genres. And I, and I think that's the sign of somebody who's very um, present in the way that they shoot and very um, 
it's have a, a lot of autonomy about how and why they shoot to, to create a very <laughs> consistent body of work because i think occasionally we can come across an image that like oh that's what i've been trying to do but it's rare that we have a, a collected body of work where it's consistently you know the consistency is a, is a great sign of mastery simply uh, of, of no matter what anybody does really um and so it's nice to get a breadth, a breadth of work to just get a, a real clarity around around how that's woven through and um yeah, thanks for for giving us a uh, giving us a bit of scope for uh, the questions you probably answered a million times over, and um, no, and no having problem. the patience to to just speak to us in in our terms and in our language and, and in our way and at our pace. And um, there's a lot of acknowledgements I think we've already done for the show. I, I I think it's very significant how you've kept the longevity and the curiosity and the humility that you have through through such a breadth of such a long career and. And how that's translating very literally through your engagement and real living relationships with the younger generation of photographers over there. And um yeah, and and legacy you're gonna leave behind in print is like few photographers have or ever will, and particularly with the way things are changing in the future and how how print's shrinking down, you know, it's a very clear way for someone to live longer than us. And I kind of wonder how legacy is gonna live on when it's zeros and ones on a on a hard drive, you know, and on screens. It's I wouldn't say it's irrelevant and we can judge it, but at the same time, it's it's hard to fathom legacy in the same way as we're slowly moving out of the print realm more and more. Um, so well, not, a lot of people keep buying books. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's going to disappear, but it, you know, even as a working photographer, you know, all the relationships with magazines, even though I used to, they're just disappearing and even working with newspapers and everything else, it's all those relationships are changing and slipping away and journalism and things like that. It's not a doom and gloom conversation, but it and well, it, and it's actually alluding to the fact that you, from a lot of the photographers I've seen that that are, are still working over such a long period of time, you've managed to adapt and modernize and embrace the technical changes and the social media aspects, and and yet you've kept an authenticity and integrity to your work at the same time as as clearly having a very wonderful ability to adapt to change. And yeah, I, I just really wanted to acknowledge you for that, William, as a, as a photographer of, uh, you know, who's had such a long career. Um, that takes a certain flexibility and open-mindedness and courageousness and, and willingness to, um, to, to embrace the new. And that's not always the case for a lot of photographers who have, have had a, such a long career. Well, thank you. I have, I have to credit Ansel for that. I mean, he was very, uh, excited about new technologies and digital i mean his images were being scanned when his last books were being made already and he yeah, was very excited about that digital spot meters that was a big thing you know so yeah i i, I caught that from ansel he was very interested in new technologies there's an amazing um consistency from your film work to digital work as well like um yeah you know obviously there's comparing 100% recent work to 100% older work, you can sort of, you know, tell there's a slight difference in um, medium, but it, there's not like this harsh sort of contrast of, like sometimes I'll see one of your images that were taken in 1980. I was like, that just looks seamless with work that you produced last year. Like it's, um, yeah, it's it's quite a unique thing to have, I don't know, just the yeah, images created across four decades that look so cons in like such a beautiful, consistent aesthetic with each other um across you know 35 mil film to four by five film through to modern sony digital cameras um i think that's something to be commended as well is just that consistency across such a long career um and a lot yeah. of safe mediums from you know high-end large format transparency uh off the hip 35 mil to and i know enough to know you, you use lots of different systems and and you don't get caught up with brands or anything and you, you just see the camera for what it is a box of light that you express yourself through and I, I kind of appreciate that as well mm. yeah yeah but we've uh we've kind of hit a pretty natural um point of reflection i think to maybe let things go unless um lukey you got anything else you want to ask you that you haven't had a chance to now now's your moment <laughs> no, no it's all good i mean it's just been such an incredible body of work and i think um you guys have um covered off the my, my thoughts pretty well there too in terms of just the longevity and the the, the consistency there and it was nice to see a few um, Sony RAW files in there too, of course, uh, in the Lightroom <laughs> oh, catalog. Yeah, but 
uh, but yes, no, it's, um, yeah, it's been absolutely uh, wonderful to have you have you with us, William, and um, really appreciate your time and um, your, your um, incredible insights over such a period of time. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. So, William, I, I assume the best portal for people to engage, not just with your work, but with the upcoming projects with the, the book release and also the latest ebook about your portfolio development, along with lots of other things, is, is your website. It's it's one of the most comprehensive websites I think I've ever seen, to be honest. Good. Well, um, you know, one thing I like about social media, lots of lots of things not to like, but but I like it as a as a diary for myself. You know, and 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 I feel that somewhat instructive in, tar in terms of my daily creative life. You know, what did I do? You know, yesterday, what did I see? You know, it's it's something that keeps me engaged. Um, so uh, join join me on social media and check out the web page and um, sounds it's all good. And I feel yeah, I feel it's. Uh... Yeah, special for us to to get a sense of, I guess, legacy. That's there's not Australia is such a young country, and New Zealand, in terms of our our relationship with landscape photography, it's fairly young, and and it's really lovely. I think we've been done a quite a lot of connection between the US community and and through our show, and I feel like we've got a lot a lot to learn from each other. And uh, I know we've sold you a little bit on Tasmania. It'd be interesting to see if you actually make it over here one day, but. That would be a pleasure to show you around. And, and likewise, um, I would certainly love to um, say hello next time I'm up in your direction, if if that's an option. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Yosemite is a pretty special I'll... place to me too, actually, amongst most of most of California. Yeah, yeah I'd hope, hope to get your way someday, mm. if I have enough time left. <laughs> yeah, there's always enough time. It's a mantra I tell myself, there's always yeah. enough time. It helps settle the soul just thinking it. But um, well, thank you again, William. Um, it's kind of hard to cut off because there's still a million things I love to connect with, and and perhaps we can we can do another show sometime down the track. Because yeah. yeah, I I'm quite aware that we literally just got a fingernail and just scratched the surface of of one of the greatest, I would say one of the greatest bodies of work in in the natural and landscape realm of of modern time. So um, thank you for at least giving us a window into it. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Will. It's been, yeah, really inspiring. Um, and yeah, definitely recommend everyone to just go check out his work at, at your own pace where you can just delve into how, how beautiful and subtle and evocative it really is, um, which as Paul said, we've gotten just a small taste of today. So yeah, good night to you, Will. And thank you so much again for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. See Bye. you guys till next time.